This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. So when you throw religion, medicine, government, and popular culture together in this mix, you get this, what I describe as America's purest experiment in true totalitarianism and all of society drive using every available means, law, culture, medicine, religion, absolutely everything to drive homosexuality to total extinction and obliteration. That's what they were trying to do. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and it is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. I say it every time. So remember, subscribe or follow, depending on your app. And of course, leave a good rating and write that review. The reviews in particular really do help. So I'll put a link in our show notes to make it easy for you to do just that, especially Apple. Apple is the big, you know, the big one. So um, that would be a huge favor to us and help involve more people in conversations just like the one we're having today with my friend, Jonathan Rausch. Jonathan Rausch is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Many folks who've listened to this show will remember he's been on. This is actually, I think you're replacing Madrid, Mike Madrid, as the most frequent guest on TPNR. So that's uh, that means you're special to us, uh, John. <laughs> Whoa, I'm 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 honored. I yeah, think absolutely. Well, you know, I, I mean, it depends. It, you know, some people think it's uh, a, something you have to suffer through. So you're 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 doing it so others don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I I enjoy I enjoy your show hugely, Corey, and I am happy to be the go-to person when you're desperate and can't get anyone better. <laughs> oh man, that would be. Uh, I don't know. I I would want to flip that on its head, not just you know, blow smoke up your ass, but, um, you, it really is like, it isn't. So Liz Joyner and I were talking about this the other day. Um, there's something that just absolutely tickles me that I get to call you John, because, you know, I've, re I've read your work for like years and years and years. And I think if you would, and years right. and years <laughs> yeah. and years, thanks for that young man. <laughs> Well, you're not you're not nearly as old as you look, or or something like that. <laughs> oh, you're digging yourself in deeper. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, no, in all seriousness, if you're trying to compliment me here, you better just rewind and start over. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, no, I, in, in all seriousness, it is an honor to be able to call you John because I've I've read your work and thought of you as this you know great scholar, Jonathan Roush. And the first person who mentioned you as John Roush was um, Joshua Good. Uh, the fellow who runs, um, uh, he mentioned Faith you. Faith Angle, and, yeah, he's Trey. Yeah, Faith Angle Forum, that's right. So he mentioned you and, and Pete Wainer. And I was like giving him crap because that's like a Hollywood trick. It's like, um, I think I mentioned this uh, when I was talking to Liz. If you know Robert De Niro, you say Bobby, you know, or or Marty, Marty Scorsese, you know. But you're even, I think... It, <laughs> I think you're even cooler like that. I get to call you John Roush. It's pretty cool. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you're impressed because you're the only one. And no, that's not true. I don't know if Liz mentioned this, but she is friends friends since high school with Julianne Moore. Is that her name? Julianne Moore, the, the oh, famous wow. actress. Yeah. Wow. One of my favorite actresses. School. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, okay. So yeah, there, there's still there's still much to learn about my, our our mutual friend Liz. Shout out to Liz. I hope she listens. She you are one of her favorites. So I, I think she looks for certain guests, um, and she'll make hopefully she'll make sure to listen to this one. So I, did, have I ever asked you if you still play piano? I no longer play piano. Oh, I I haven't owned a piano since high school, and last time I opened some sheet music. I discovered to my grief that I could no longer read it. Oh, really? Yeah, you lose it if you don't use it. It's like well, a foreign language. My my fingers get rusty, and I would have to start at a, like a beginner's chart. But over time, I, I, I picked it up again in my 30s, because when we first moved out to California, we just couldn't afford a piano, and I couldn't even afford like an 88-key touch-sensitive keyboard. So I got away from it for like 10 years. And the fingers were rusty, but the muscle memory came back in my 30s. I'd be interested to see if I revisited it now in my early 50s. Um, it, I just I realized that I learn differently the older that I get. 
not that I'm necessarily slower, but it is kind of slower. Uh, but, and also my motivations for, for doing it is, is different. So, um, I do have a different question for you. I kind of tipped my hat before we hit record. Is America going through the equivalent of its thirties and forties, like the bottom of the U on our collective happiness curve, or is that an insufficient lens, uh, when we're looking at happiness on a societal scale? Okay, so I wrote this book called Happiness Curve, published in 2018, and it's about a natural tendency for people's life satisfaction to bottom out in their mid and late 40s and why that's a natural transition and not a crisis at all. And your mileage may vary, but it happens to a lot of people, including me. And the fact that people don't know about it and they panic makes it all worse. So that was that book. So does that apply to America as a whole? Um, I don't think so. But mm. you know, I'm... I'm a political guy, right? I, I yeah. look at stuff like political primaries, polarization, partisanship, negative partisanship, affective polarization. Uh, right now I'm working on a book on religion and democracy, which basically says democracy is in trouble because Christianity is failing. So that's all on you, Corey. You're a Christian. Um, but seriously, I think a big problem that we're having is the the failure of our main transmission mechanism for spiritual growth and spiritual grounding. And it turns out democracy doesn't function very well without those things. But I, I look at things like that. I don't think there's like a natural life cycle for democracy. At least I hope there's not. So would you then say that if I've heard you talk about how individuals are going through stuff that, you know, to your point, the happiness curve, it's a book that we haven't discussed much. But I'm wondering if folks addressed on an individual level what they're actually going through and why they, they might be drawn to a MAGA rally uh, in, in, lieu of, uh, in lieu of something that wasn't as idolatrous, for, for lack of a better word. Um, so I'm wondering if each of us individually addressed where we were on the happiness curve um, if that collectively would make a difference? Or am I straining to, to tie the societal with the individual to, together too hard? You might be straining, I think. There, is, there are connections. Uh, people don't really notice or talk about this, but deaths of despair are very age-related. So mm -hmm. we see those disproportionately in middle age. And depression, suicide generally are very age related. So middle years are hard years for people. But I don't think that's the big thing driving our political distemper. Um, I point you instead to things like the way media has changed, the way political primaries are functioning. And as I said earlier, the fact that people are turning away from religion and bringing that energy to politics, people are looking for spiritual affinity in politics, which is not designed for it. And, and in turn, they're bringing politics into church, yeah. uh, which church is not designed for. And that is corrupting both sides. Yeah. So I definitely want to, if we have time, I, I definitely want to ask you about your upcoming book. But um, the main reason I wanted you to come in today is th there was actually a couple articles recently in The Atlantic. Uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about Sandra Day O'Connor as well. But the main reason is um, a piece that you wrote uh, that came out in January called The U.S. Should Apologize to Gay People. for uh, And the subtitle is For Decades, the Government Led a Campaign to Erase Them from Public Life, a Reckoning is Long Past Due. So the first thing that was really striking in reading that article, um, how, how do you pronounce uh, one of the main uh, characters or main people that you, um, you share about first? Is it Jan Kirk or Jan Kirk? He pronounces it Jan Kirch. It's Kirch. spelled... KRC. He's, yeah. he's Czech by birth, though, of course, he's been an American since teenage. So um, Jan Kirch. So I was taken aback by the fact that the events you were describing didn't take place in 1944 or 1954 even, but in 1984. That's yeah, and, and on into the 90s. It wasn't until 2011 when the ban on homosexuals serving in the military was was lifted. That that wasn't very long ago. It, it wasn't until 2009 that President Obama signed an executive order ending uh, discrimination against gay and lesbian federal employees in, in terms of benefits. Even then, he only partly ended it. 
this is not ancient history. Jan right. Kirch is, he's like, you know, my age, he's a couple of years older. Like he's in his mid sixties. He's walking the streets right now. He has never received a government apology for the hell he was put through for, for nine years and the complete stop that was put to his career and the weight that he lost and the depression that he suffered and the, the pain that he went through with his family. And um, there's thousands and thousands of Americans like that right now among us. Yeah. Yeah. There's so, there's so many questions I have. I mean, and, and uh, you know, I read your book, Denial. Um, my, I think it's called uh, the subtitle, My 25 Years Without a Soul. Um, and I, I was thinking that the, the pervasive uh, default posture of, of our culture uh, towards um, homosexuals um, is affects people on a very real level. Even as a boy, um, you had this sense that there there was something wrong. There was something, at the very least, distasteful. Um, but uh, so I was I was um, I was taken aback by how, like I said, how pervasive this this problem was. But the question that kept arising for me was why. Why this obsession? Why the attempts at eradication? And have you, you know, it's it's almost unfair for me to ask that of you because in a way you're the victim and not not the one who should explain the ones who are um, imposing this uh, this mindset. But have have you grappled with that? I've tried, not very successfully. It's the question that people ask most often, and, and one thing to say about it is in, in a minute, I hope we'll turn to actually describing what, what was done to gay people in the, the war on homosexuality, the, the war to erase us, which lasted at least 70 years. Yeah. But, but it's hard to put your mindset in a day when people didn't ask the question, why are you persecuting, oppressing, and erasing homosexuals? It would never occur to them not to. They thought it was just so obvious that homosexuality was subversive to the country, a threat to the well-being of children, destructive of families, a mental disease, and a terrible form of sin that would bring, bring God's judgment down on the country. These, these were not question dogmas. So they would look at us today and say, well, how do you explain your absurd toleration for this horrible deviant lifestyle? Um, that said, I can I can tell you some things that happened. You can tell me as well as I can tell you what explains them. But one of them was that with industrialization and the movement that started really accelerating in the late 19th century, you saw people moving to cities. And as that happened, you began to see gay and lesbian people, as we came to call them, homosexual people congregating together in more visible ways, you know, socializing, cross-dressing, having parties at their homes. And that caused a backlash. Gender conformity, or sorry, gender non-conformity has always been something that, that causes panic and distress and dismay in a lot of people. So that started really gaining steam in the 20s, World War II was a big distraction, but starting, but it brought together a lot of gay men in the military. And that continued after the war with, with more gay visibility, plus the Cold War happened. And for reasons I don't think anyone completely understands, in the mid-1940s, starting in the federal government and then fanning out all through society, this idea develops that communism and homosexuality are just two sides of the same coin. They are both sick, perverse, godless efforts to subvert American morals and democracy. And they become intertwined in the McCarthyism movement, in the federal government's persecution, in the FBI, and then they filter down very rapidly to state and local policies and law enforcement so that by the 1950s, every level of government is conducting massive sweeps, spying on gay people, running informant networks, getting them fired from their government jobs, arresting them so they're fired from their private sector jobs. And then one other thing happens, I'm sorry for the filibuster, but it's hard to shorten all this history. 
homosexuality gets identified as a psychiatric condition starting in the late 19th century. And, and Sigmund Freud was not especially anti-gay. He, he, didn't, he wasn't concerned about it. But a lot of other psychiatrists and psychologists adopted the morals of the time, which said this is something sick and perverse. So they incorporated that into psychology in the 20s and 30s on into the 40s so that by the 1950s, psychiatry is officially designating homosexuality as a mental illness, a form of sociopathy. So now science has thrown its massive weight behind this policy. And lest we forget, there's Christianity. Yeah. Um, Christianity and Judaism had, had anti-gay strains going back to the time of, of Philo, who is a Jewish philosopher back, I think, around the time of Christ. But all of that, again, really takes off in the 20th century. And a lot of Christians just become obsessed with homosexuality. They think it's a stench in God's nostrils, and it becomes front and center in the evangelical movement for decades. So when you throw religion, medicine, government, and popular culture together in this mix, you get this, what I describe as America's purest experiment in true totalitarianism and all of society drive using every available means, law, culture, medicine, religion, absolutely everything to drive homosexuality to total extinction and obliteration. That's what they were trying to do. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money, <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me, he knows my family, and I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on, and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals, and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which by the way, could change from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Mesa and Mesa Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mesawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mesawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. What I don't get is what's the threat? You know, when you look at even the McCarthy hearings and we're, we're trying to root out communists among us, I can sort of, I can, I can get my head around, well, this is a threat to democracy. There, there are most, you know, prominent um, uh, adversary. Uh, so that, that makes sense. But even the McCarthy hearings were somewhat contained in terms of, you know, how long they went on. Uh, but this was something that was, again, the word pervasive, but also persistent. The fact that it went well into the 80s and 90s, as you sketch in, in your piece, um, you know, but if you rewind a little bit, you also point out the history of this, that this sodomy laws were not always interpreted this way. Sodomy laws were originally put on the books, if I'm remembering correctly, um, for actually, now that I think of it, for exactly what's actually happening. And we're finding out the kind of investigative journalism work that Nancy French is doing about say Canacook camps. Um, sodomy laws were put on the books to protect uh, victims of that, uh, of sexual uh, assault. Uh, yeah, sexual that. assault, sexual abuse is what we call it today, right? They were not initially targeted to gay people. That begins happening in the latter half of the 19th century. Yeah, I don't know. How do you explain anti-Semitism? Why would people 
across the globe in cultures everywhere believe that Jews are a satanic influence who drink the blood of babies and who run the world financial system. And, and how do you explain that? But there are these these memes, these ideas, these prejudices, which are very deep rooted and and somehow strike chords in us. It has to do with with fear of gender nonconformity, and that remains, as you know, uh, better than a lot of people, a, a very real issue in society. And some of it has, I think, probably I'm I'm winging it here, but but it has to do with the need of humans for for a devil, for an enemy, for an explanation for why things are either going wrong or perceived to go wrong or the or the threat against we can unite. And homosexuals are a small minority and very easy to target. Maybe it is because it, it's it's um it's more convenient. It's more of a, a it's actually a less threatening target because if you look at um violence that occurs you know, uh, the current governor of, of Florida would have you believe that there's great violence and harm being imposed by LGBT uh, folks. Um, but it's, it's just the opposite. So that, that's, that's what I, it's hard for me to get my, my head around that. Yeah. That's actually kind of charming. You know, we live in a world now where people walk around thinking, how could anyone ever have thought these things? But the real amazing thing is that you exist because for 2000 years, it was assumed that homosexuals were, were dangerous and, and, and depraved. Um, and, you know, some of it's from the Bible, of course, that has the Bible, I think has been misinterpreted, but m many Christians, probably most Christians today believe that, that Paul uh, condemns homosexuality and that homosexuality is an abomination because of a, chapter a verse in Leviticus. So let's not leave that out. Yeah. So I, I think, I forget if we've talked about this before. I've talked about it with other um, scholars of ancient Hebrew and, and um, Aramaic and, and uh, Greek, and they're, they're, they, they study the Bible as close to the original language as they can. And coincidentally, um, in most of the places that uh, the NASB or other contemporary translations have the word homosexual, the actual more accurate, the, the more accurate translation would be, again, sexual abuse. Uh, but the, the, the concept of homosexuality just, it, it wasn't a word. It wasn't even, um, it wasn't even a concept, certainly when the, the Paul's letters were being written. So that um, I, I've learned, I've learned quite a bit about that over the last couple of years. And it's not, the irony isn't lost on me that the American Evangelical Church, good other folks I've become friends with through doing this work, Dr. Russell Moore, you know, there was tension that built up when he objected to the, uh, the embrace of Trump uh, among the Southern Baptist Convention. But what ultimately forced him out of his position in the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission uh, as a leader of, of that uh, within the SPC was when he said, we have to take these charges uh, credibly, we have to take these charges of sexual abuse credibly. That ultimately is what what got Russell Moore pushed out. So, um, the other man, the other uh, thing that that really stuck with me because um, I read it when it first came out in January. I just reread re it this week, um, the piece. But the <laughs> there there's one quote uh, by fire. You were talking about Frank Kameny. Um, you said by firing him for no other reason than his sexual orientation, uh, Kameny, Frank Kameny claimed the government had engaged in employment discrimination. More than that, however, this is the part that really caught my attention. It had violated the Constitution by establishing a tyranny over the mind of its citizen. So first of all, can you share a little bit about that case? But second of all, there's a larger context of what we're in danger of more broadly as a country now. And again, maybe I'm tying too many things together here, but I'm seeing that um, this type of tyranny uh, can be can be metastasized. And this may be the direction that we're going if we don't recognize uh, some of the signs that we see. So uh, first, again, if you could share a little bit about the Frank Kameny case, but then maybe comment, uh, am I off base in the, some of the conclusions I'm drawing as well? Two big things there, and I'll try not to filibuster inter interrupt at any moment. Frank Kameny 
was the most important LGBT civil rights leader of the 20th century, and he died as recently as 2011. So he's very much a contemporary figure. And I would guess that only a handful of your audience has ever even heard of him. So that that history, like most of the history of the campaign to erase homosexuality, has been swept under the rug. Dr. Kameny was a combat veteran of World War II. He was a Harvard-trained PhD astronomer, brilliant, brilliant man, who was fired from his government job in 1957 because he was gay. Um, he had, uh, uh, there was an incident where there was a police report and he was fired for it. Most people in those days, virtually everyone who was fired for being gay essentially slunk away, slinked away because you had to. Uh, there was no chance of winning an appeal and you were now marked as a reprobate in society. And if you were a teacher, for example, or a banker, certainly a minister, anything like that, you would lose your job. Kameny lost his job, but he was unusual. He thought the Declaration of Independence, his promise of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness was a promise specifically to him. So he did a lot of things. He appealed his firing through the U.S. Civil Service Commission, got nowhere. He appealed to Congress. Uh, he was told he was the most disgusting person who had ever contacted one member of Congress. And he wrote the first gay civil rights uh, lawsuit and appealed it all the way up to the Supreme Court with help of an ACLU lawyer. And you can still read the brief today that he wrote in 1961. The Supreme Court did not hear his case, but what Kameny says in this brief is very interesting. He says that he fought with guns to protect the country in Europe during World War II, and now he must, against tyranny in Europe, and now he must fight with words against tyranny in the United States. And of course, what he's suing for is to get his job back in the government, but he doesn't frame this as a case strictly about workplace discrimination. He calls out the government for tr exercising what he calls tyranny over the mind of the citizen. He understands that what this, this campaign of erasing the very concept of homosexuality from American life is a campaign that's aimed at our minds. It's a totalitarian effort to abolish the very concept so that people don't even think about it. He understands that this is a totalitarian campaign, and that's the way he phrases it in this in this document. You know, one of the um, – I'm reading this book by a, a great scholar named Danielle Allen. She's at, at Harvard, and her 2023 book is called Justice – by means of democracy. I might be just slightly missing the title, but justice by means of democracy. And she talks about the threat of tyranny um, when we start to threaten basic freedoms. She she breaks them up into, um, I'm, again, I'm messing it up because it's way above my head, but negative freedoms and positive freedoms. So, um, you know, positive freedoms meaning that which we can participate in democracy, like voting is an obvious one. Um, and then some other freedoms that I think of is like, leave me alone, let me do my thing, <laughs> you know. Um, but but one is the freedom of assembly. So when the freedom of assembly is threatened, it, it allow like such as they uh, such in China today, um, it allows for tyranny to prosper uh, or, or, or tyrants. Uh, to prosper. So what I think of is that, um, as as you mentioned, um, you know, gay folks couldn't gather without the threat of being outed, being arrested, being all these things. Um, and that basic freedom, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of getting together um, is one of those basic freedoms. Well, people people don't know this, but I want to I want to hit that point, just yeah. emphasize it before we move on, if that's okay, which yeah. is some people know that there were sodomy laws, which outlawed homosexuality. And that was the case in all 50 states in 1960. And probably fewer people know that in many of those states, 
those laws applied not just in public places like parks or public restrooms. They applied everywhere, including your home. And they were enforced in some cases. But what almost no one knows is that the sodomy laws, the criminalization of homosexuality was just the tip of the iceberg because what state and local authorities did following on the federal government's cue is weaponize laws like public delinquency, loitering, obscenity, public nuisance laws. All of these statutes they had that were very vague and broad liquor licenses, and they were enforced to make it legally hazardous for gay and lesbian people to even socialize and gather even in their own homes. They could be busted by the police. And my cousin, again, alive and well, it's not even that old. He's in his 70s. He narrowly escaped arrest at a a gay bar in 1970 in Indianapolis because he went home early that night just before the bar sweep where the cops move in and they arrest dozens of people. And then the rigmarole is those people lose their jobs the next day. Um, and some of them have to leave town because they're so disgraced. So that's what I mean by totalitarianism. There's, It's not like segregation where there are separate institutions. There is literally nowhere you can go, nowhere you can hide. Right. <clears throat> so the the connection I was making earlier was that this sort of tyranny, um, we saw the coming attractions of it. Um, we know that uh, Lafayette Square, the uh, June of what was that, 2020, uh, when Trump took military person, military leaders, cleared Lafayette Square so he could do his, you know, ape holding up a Bible thing in front of uh, the, the church. Um, but that that's just a coming attraction, you know? So, so uh, we're talking specifically about the history of, of the, the, you know, um, mass uh, eradication of, of homosexuals. Um, but be, before, before we, you can address that point, but something very important I, I wanna make sure that I ask you about, I think uh, one of the main points of writing the piece is, as you say, ensuring that the past and its victims are not forgotten. Are there any, uh, how much work have you done in learning about some of the victims historically, whether it's recent past or, you know, over the last hundred years? Um, and if there's anybody in particular that comes to mind whose story, you did outline a couple of folks. We talked about Frank Kameny and Jan Kirch, um, got it right this time. Uh, he deserves to be, have his name uh, said correctly. Um, w- was there anyone else uh, whose story you'd like to share? Well, also, I, I mentioned my cousin in there. Cousin. I mentioned my own story. Um, I'm I'm old enough so that I grew up thinking that I wasn't a homosexual because if I were a homosexual, that would make me insane. That would make me mentally ill. And believe me, I did not want to be mentally ill. So, um, so I think of myself in that category, but as our, as our president would say, here's the thing. <laughs> there, there are two aspects of this that are deeply troubling in the present. And one, which we'll get to, you alluded to earlier, which is the continuing effort around the country to erase homosexuality from places like school curriculum, public libraries, And we should talk about that because it's happening right now. The campaign has not ended. But the other thing that's deeply troubling is there has never been an accounting or any kind of reckoning for what was done over a period of decades to gay people. And the result of that is that we do not know the numbers of people who were fired by the government, um, discharged from the military who lost their jobs in private employers. We don't know how many people were arrested and harassed by police. All we know is the numbers are at least into the hundreds of thousands. Getting these records, a a wonderful group called the Mattachine Society of Washington, D.C., originally founded by Frank Kameny, is doing the work of trying to shake loose the documentation from government files of who was persecuted and how it was done. 
And getting that stuff has been like pulling teeth. So we don't know the numbers of people. We don't know the names of people. We don't know the stories. All of this has been locked away. Some of it is in people's attics and boxes, you know, Uncle Uncle James's um, records. Some of it is in private hands. A little of it is, is in the Library of Congress. But mostly, we have never reckoned with this history and we have very little knowledge of it. It's gone down the memory hole. And that's, I think that's dreadful. That's why I argue that this country owes itself and its gay and lesbian LGBT citizens a reckoning. And that should take the form, first of all, a government apology for the things that the government actually did to the people to whom it was done, many of whom are still living. Second, there should be a form of at least symbolic restitution for that, for the people who were discharged from the military, fired from the government. They should be given some kind of at least symbolic compensation. Third, all the people who were harassed and arrested by state and local police should be retroactively pardoned. The states and the governors should, should pardon those people, should say we were wrong. Maybe most important is there needs to be a truth commission. There needs to be a national archival effort to search out those records and begin to assemble them in a place where we can rebuild the record of what was done over those 40, 50, 60 years. None of that has happened in any systematic way. And I just think that's, I think that's shameful that we don't know the names, the numbers, or the stories. Yeah, again, the question of why, why it keeps coming up for me. But I want to I want to ask a, a different sort of question. You you were someone at least going back to the early 90s that started working on the cause of uh, marriage equality and ultimately saw um, with Obergefell uh, the right to to marry, <laughs> you know, um, a long slog of a campaign. Are you hopeful that what you just outlined in terms of a reckoning um, in those those four or five different ways, that that can happen over the next decade or two? Well, you got to be hopeful. Um, Efforts in Congress to introduce resolutions that would publicly state what was done and formally apologize on behalf of either the government as a whole or Congress for what was done have gone nowhere. There's one that was introduced by Senator Tim Kaine of my home state of Virginia in the previous session of Congress. And, and it didn't, it got, it got no interest. It never came to a vote. Um, He's, he's hoping to reintroduce it in this Congress. So, so far I'd say there's been, there's been very little interest. Part of that is because we're not teaching this to kids in schools. We teach some civil rights history of African-American civil rights, and they have a vague idea of uh, what was done to Native Americans. But apart from a mention here and there of the Stonewall riots of 1969, there's virtually nothing about what happened to gay people. And there is, as I mentioned earlier, a national effort by groups with names like Moms for Liberty (laughs) to eliminate all mentions of homosexuals and homosexuality from school curriculums, to get them out of school libraries, to get them out of public libraries. There was a library, a public library, where they actually took, unshelved a book whose author's last name was gay. Now, they did eventually restore that book to the shelf, but that tells you the degree of paranoia among librarians, that they would obliterate even the word gay. So we see the continuation of these efforts to obliterate the lives, the stories of homosexual people from American society right now. So am I hopeful? At short term, no, I'm not. What I, I, I think a lot of people like Jan Kurtz are not gonna be here in 10 or 15 years. They're they're aging and they won't be here to tell their stories. So it makes me very sad that a lot of those people probably won't see 
the acknowledgement that they deserve. These were Jan, Jan Kirch. I mean, my, his story is in my article, but this is a guy who fled communism at age 12. His greatest day in life was becoming American citizen as a teenager. All he wanted was to serve his government patriotically, working as a, a, a diplomat in the State Department. At age 26, was fired because it came to light that he was homosexual. And that's it. That's a firing sense. You, you can't be a homosexual and work in the State Department. And he's persecuted for nine years trying to get his job back. He's parked in an office in, in a dead-end job. They're trying to make him quit, but they won't give him a job recommendation to get any other jobs. He files a grievance. He files a lawsuit. It goes on and on. He, he loses the lawsuit. He finally gets back into the government in the 90s, but he has to start all over. And he never gets those years back. Those people they won't be around for much longer. So am I hopeful in the short term? Not particularly. Am I hopeful in the longer term? I guess I am. And, and the reason for that is that America has done right. It took a long time, but it finally did in the 80s apologize for and compensate for the uh, descendants of the Japanese Americans and some of the actual people then still alive who were interned in what amount to concentration camps. Um, it passed an apology for lynching, for example. The state of Massachusetts in the 1950s formally apologized for the Salem witch trials. So it takes a while, but it means people like you and me have got to decide we care about it enough to work for it. Right. And to um, remember those stories, do, do the history work on um, the people, the victims. Uh, so as you say, that, so that they're not forgotten um, I did allude to the uh, another recent piece um, that you wrote. It was a tribute to Sandra Day O'Connor. Did you ever discuss these issues with her? Uh, you were, f first of all, just a little bit of background. You actually knew her. You grew up with her. She was like your neighborhood mom kind of a thing. Um, so uh, please if, if share however much you like about that. But that's, uh, I, I was curious if you ever discussed, I mean, she was a Supreme Court justice. So I'm curious if you ever talked about this with her and what her take on it would, might be. I never did. I, I didn't know her as, as a grown up. Um, I visited her in her chambers a couple of times, once with my father, uh, once with my sister. And she was very cordial. But I knew her as Mrs. O'Connor, the mm. mom next door. I guess there's one house in between us. But, but her, uh, her, two of her sons, Brian and Jay, one was my age, one was a little younger. We were, we were playmates. And uh, my house was kind of dysfunctional in those years. And so I was I was in and out of the O'Connor's house and her house was kind of the home away from home. She was one of the busiest people in Phoenix. She was on multiple boards. She was a, well, a renowned lawyer and later a politician and, and judge. But she always somehow seemed to have time to be home. And to be with with kids, I'd always see her coming and going in her tennis whites. <laughs> and she was um, super welcoming to me. I still remember the exact way she would say, well, hello, John Roush, <laughs> when I came into the house. <laughs> That's great. Um, and so she just became like um, her house and, and she specifically became just kind of an anchor in my life when I was growing up. Um, then I moved away to college, and and uh, I still remember when, when I was 21, President Reagan was looking for a woman to put on the Supreme Court to meet his campaign promise. And I remember telling all my friends, "Oh man, I know exactly the person, Sandra Day O'Connor, but but he'll never pick her. He'll never think of her. But thanks to Barry Goldwater, he did. How about that? Yeah. That's awesome. Do you know if any of her kids uh, read read your tribute to her in the Atlantic? Yes, I I do know. Um, and they were they were happy about it. Oh, they got great. in touch with me. I'm still in touch with um, two of the three O'Connor boys. And in fact, I had coffee with one of them the the other day. I never had the opportunity to discuss you know gay rights with with Justice O'Connor. Our meetings with her were social, but I do know that there are um, there are gay people in in her family circle and in in her general circle and. As far as I know, she never showed anything but but love and affection for those people. Yeah.
Yeah, I, it was uh, it was it was great to read your piece because it was a, a more personal piece than a lot of the profiles that were being written uh, after she passed. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm 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 always a sucker for a Roush piece whenever I can catch it. Uh, but that that one in particular, I, I really appreciated, given the the flood of other tributes that we were seeing uh, and profiles that we were seeing. But um, one of the other things I did want to I did want to ask you about. So you have is there a date certain for this this upcoming book? I think you, you I think I heard you mention January of 2025. Yes, uh, January of 2025. So that would be the time to get me on to do that. I mean, I'm always happy to discuss the issues, but. Uh... <laughs> Is that the one you're going to flesh out the four M's? That's the one. Yeah. Oh man. That's the four M's. And, and that's the one about um, the church of fear, as I call it, which is replaced the church of, well, the, the Bible's possibly most frequent injunction is, is be not afraid. And we're not, we're not seeing that spirit necessarily no. in Christian churches. So yeah, it's that book. Anger and fear. It's like uh, crack for the brain. Um, you know, so for someone who's an atheist, you have a profound sense of the soul. Uh, and I keep on going back to to the that short book, Denial. Um, one of the quotes, I, I was going through it again. Um, the soul is a sovereign, but without love, it has no kingdom. That's uh, a great quote. Yeah. So as do you do you do you ever do you ever. I start to think, man, it, he doesn't, my friend John doesn't believe in God, but it's almost like, you know, the existence of a soul, um, you, you, you understood it by its abs by your, your fear of its absence in a way. So the, you're a, qua you're a quagmire for me, man. You're a quagmire wrapped in a oh. quandary. <laughs> um, but I'll uh, take that as a compliment. It, it's absolutely a compliment. Same to you, dude, but that's, that's true of all Christians to me. It's terra incognita. I've, I've learned to, to kind of intellectually understand it, but, but you're a riddle wrapped within an enigma because you're a former <laughs> Jew who's now a Christian. I am. I am. Well, I, I wouldn't say former Jew. I'm very much Jew. In fact, uh, I don't think I shared this with you when we got together a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, after October 7th, I started going to synagogue. Uh, I, I don't go every single week, but I felt very compelled that, that next Saturday to go to the Chabad uh, in our town. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, my dad, he's in New York half the year, and uh, him and my mom are, are in this side of the country during the winter. So he was, uh, I surprised him and I showed up at a, a Torah service on a Saturday morning. Um, but I, I've also stayed in much closer touch with my cousins in Israel. Uh, so there are certain aspects of, I can't stop being a Jew. Like, you know how it is. It's just because yeah. you're an atheist, you're still a Jew. Um, yes, of course. And there's, okay. So the other thing I wanted to ask you about, I heard you say something on Wilkes, uh, you, you were, um, it's, I, I really enjoy his, his, the conversations he has Wilk Wilkerson from, um, Braver Angels, um, you, you, what was it that you said about religion? Oh, um, you were comparing politics as the art of negotiation, I think. Um, but religion is more about uh, rules. You used another word, but it was like the either or version of it. And I wanted to push back on something that you said. It, it, you can kind of clarify what I think I what I think I heard. I would say that religion for me, and this is why I keep coming back to certain things that we, I did growing up as a Jew, is it's about, it's about community. It's about building community. It's about practicing who we are as a people. Uh, so some of the folks sort of scoff at the idea of ritual, but I find ritual very important. You know, certain times of year we get together, uh, however, whatever our family looks like, you know, from year to year, it might look a little bit different, you know, but we get together and we do these things and we tell these stories and we do these, you know, we're practicing being a people together. So for me, religion has been about something, not necessarily about rules and either ors, uh, but about being a people. So what do you think about that? Well, I, I think it's true. I, religion is multidimensional, multifaceted. That's that's precisely why politics can't replace it. And when we start investing politics with 
the many things that we rely on religion to do, politics gets crushed under the weight. So yeah, r- religion is theology. It's it's faith in God. I don't have that. I never have. I tried at one point. But why do I identify as a Jew? Because religion is also culture. It's also community and it's ritual and practice and it's uh, traditions that go back for centuries, yeah. millennia, yeah. in the case of Christians and Jews. So, and, and nothing else is really that rich, is it? I mean, politics, for example, is is just onion skin thin compared to religion. So, yeah, of course, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I got to go back and listen to that uh I think you were on his show about a month or two ago. So I got to go back and listen to that. I, I like Wilk. He reminds me a little bit of my brother, uh, not just because they're both truckers, but uh, because they're, they're talk about an onion. There's a lot more than just the, you know, the first layer. There's so many layers to that dude. So um, shout out to Wilk Wilkerson and to Brave Angels for that matter. So the idea, I, I had, a, I had another question for you too, about um, going back to the constitution of knowledge. So it's kind of a follow up to to what we were just saying. It's not just about putting people with differences to like the the one of the um one of the antibodies that we have is like putting people together uh across differences and having these conversations. That's what I'm trying to do here. But one of the other things that you said in that um conversation with Wilk was it's not just about putting people with differences together. And you you went into great depth in the constitution constitution of knowledge about this you said it's that's also- a book i wrote by the way available at fine retailers everywhere <laughs> we'll have links in the show notes i can assure you um you said it's about having certain rules and a certain structure of discourse but i i am hopeful but at the same time i'm scared the question is what if we're among neighbors who refuse to accept the entire structure what do we do then well that's i mean the $64,000 question, right? So the structure you're talking about, what I call the constitution of knowledge, are all the hoops that you and I have to go through in order to claim that that we actually know something in order to add to the canon of knowledge. So that means if you're a scientist, you're going to be doing experiments. If you're a historian, you're going to be bound by evidence and you're going to force be forced to defend your arguments. If you're a lawyer... You're going to present evidence and arguments in certain ways. If you're a journalist, you're going to be, you're going to be fact checked and edited and learn a lot of protocols about how many sources to use and what's news and what isn't. And all of those things structure the way we talk to each other and the way we test ideas. And if you don't have that structure, all you've got is just a huge chaos of people shouting at each other, which is basically what Twitter is. This is why social media doesn't work. Unmediated, unstructured conversations tend in larger groups to very quickly degenerate into posturing, trolling, seeking status and attention by attacking other people, ridicule, bullying, all the other things that that we see. So it took centuries to establish the constitution of knowledge. That's that's our framework for negotiating over reality. It's very structured. And it's been under attack since day one. It's under attack again. Um, it's under attack in the left from everyone from postmodernist to cancelers. It's under attack from the right, from the MAGA movement, and it's assault on reality. It's it's massive Russian style Disinformation exercises culminating in the lie that the election was stolen, put out over every possible channel at maximum volume with no coherence or consistency, 62 court cases, all of them lost, all but one lost. The other was technically not a loss. The, the one where they, so, they weren't were standing uh, too close or something like that. I don't I remember was, what it was. It was a technicality. It had no effect on the, yeah, the election. Yeah. But, you know, it takes real work to file 62 lawsuits and effectively lose all 62. And that's because <laughs> they were what they were doing was using the courts as a propaganda channel to spew falsehoods about the election. So the situation we're now in is we're confronted simultaneously with these attacks from the left and from the right and the challenges of social media, which is 
unfortunately, as Yuval Levin says, neither social nor mediated. Um, and all of those things are putting a huge stress on our ability to come to some sort of public agreement about reality, about facts. It's not the first time we've had epistemic crises. There was one in the late 19th century, especially in the journalism industry. There was one when the printing press was invented. That one did not end well. Resulted in 150 years of devastating warfare and a lot right. of death. Um, so the question now, and the, what I address in my book and, um, and want everyone to think about, is how do we... How do we counter these attacks? In the past, it's always been you build new institutions and norms and structures that create an environment that people want to opt into because the, the, the things that are presented there as fact and as true are more reliable and because the processes they're using are more social. You're not going to get attacked there. You're not going to be told that the, I don't know, coronavirus vaccine is is full of microchips. You're not right. going to be sent messages saying, don't forget to vote on Wednesday. People hate to be in an epistemically polluted environment where they can't trust anyone and they don't know what's true and what's false. That is not tolerable to humans. So can we build these new rules and institutions for this age, which begin to create islands of sanity, then, then begin to attract more and more people? That's what's worked in the past. You tell me if it's going to work again. I, well, islands of sanity. Um, yeah, there's a lot that we talked about that one could get pessimistic, but you said something at the beginning of the Constitution of Knowledge. You were quoting Plato and uh, those five magic words, let us meet here again. So if there's any reason to be hopeful, um, it's what you've exhibited with me on this, you know, on this show. Uh, let us meet here again. You know, my problem, though, is that I have so much I want to talk to you about. You know, every time we talk, uh, whether it's in person or, or on this uh, platform, that uh, some, sometimes I feel like we're just kind of a, a little bit windy, a little bit all over the place. But uh, that's more a reflection, not of a lack of something to talk about, but too much to talk about. So <laughs> forgive me if this wasn't as uh, as linear as, as some of our other conversations. Um, I do want to ask you a couple more questions because I know you have a you have a heart out today. So. Um, Got to ask you the TPNR question. It's it's always worth revisiting. Uh, what do you think each of us can do to be able to share space with, have better conversations with, and perhaps even nurture relationships with people across our differences? So people who have different backgrounds and beliefs than we do, who get their news from different sources than we do. How can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other? Or is it even possible? I think it's very possible. That's a super layup question for me because um, I think the answer is to get involved with Braver Angels or one of the many other groups that are now active in American communities that are working to reteach us how to listen to each other and how to talk to each other. Every time you or I spark a meaningful conversation across the political divide or across the religious divide. We are reducing the amount of polarization and fear in our society by that small quantum. But every time you do that, you also reduce our vulnerability to manipulation by dividers and conflict entrepreneurs and propagandists. So you don't have to scale this nationally all at once. This is about what, what people can do in their, their own communities. And there's, there's lots of them. There's Bridge USA. There's a whole bunch. Yeah. Braver Angels is the one that I know the best. I was a founding board member back in the day. Yeah. So I tell people to go there. Um, and you can learn. We can learn to approach others in a way that is pro-social and open to learning and meaning. It's a skill like any other skill. My favorite way to do it is to start with the question, especially when you disagree with someone or think you will, what is it about your life experience that led you to the opinions that you have? Yeah. Show some curiosity and move the axes to storytelling and not, you know, throwing facts and accusations at each other. And then from there, listen 
without the intent to refute, just listen, put that refutation aside for a few minutes. And then after you've listened, when you, when it's your turn to talk, start by rephrasing what they said. So if I understood you correctly, Corey, what you're saying is X. And if you can do all that, if you can get that right, that person will feel listened to, that person will feel seen. And you will be surprised how productive that conversation might become. And we can all do that. You know, that's a really good reminder. I know we've talked about this uh, before. You mentioned it when we had our conversations with Pete um, that, and, and folks uh, got, wrote to me about what, what you said. It was a good summation of a lot of the work of Brave Angels and Monty Guzman's work. Um, what is it about your life experience that led you to the position or the opinions that you have today? I was thinking about someone that I had a conversation with that um, Rene Darista is doing this work uh, and this phrase, bespoke realities. Um, this lady that uh, I was speaking with is in a bespoke reality. She's absolutely convinced that the 2020 election was stolen. What is not going to work, if anything can work, is me, you know, sending her an article, convincing her she's wrong, you know, banging her over the head with facts. Um, but I think the, the way I think of it is one person and one conversation and one degree. Um, you know, that's that's how I think of the work that we do. And the one degree of antibodies to some of these ailments, some of these societal ailments, um, that that's it right there is to to say to my friend, well, so what tell me tell me a little bit more about your life, your life experience that led you to that position. And then more importantly, just as importantly, as you say, to listen and see if I can understand. Uh, so that's a that's a really good exhortation. Um, do you have any questions for me? I want to know. I think I was first on the show when my book came out in uh, Constitution and Knowledge, which is almost three years ago. That was six months into the Biden administration. Does that sound yeah. right? That sounds I about right. I'll have to look at it. Yeah. I want to know if you're feeling better or worse about the state of the world since we met. Okay. So there's more to that question than just having these conversations. Um, the One of the things that I've done differently uh, in the three plus years I've been doing this is I started meditating on a daily basis. Um, I, I eschewed meditation as a practice for a long time because I thought it was some sort of religious thing and it would go against my theological convictions. It's absolutely not. It's basically breathing, not to oversimplify it, but it's basically breathing. So I do these guided meditations and I've read scientific uh, journals uh, and, and so, some books about it literally changes the how, how your brain processes stuff, you know, the neurotransmitters or something like that. Um, there's empirical scientific evidence that it changes. So I bring that up because a lot of folks are really worried about what's going to happen in November. And what I know for sure uh, is that there is a lot of time in between now and the conventions, let alone now in November. So I'm trying to stay, I'm trying to stay as much in the now as possible. Cause we, we, you know, there was a big ruling that was uh, printed yesterday. There was two or three big news stories that might affect the trajectory of, of the election. So I can deal with that. I can deal with that. I can't account for, you know, what about the 91 charges and which case is going to go forward and which one's not going to be heard? And are there going to be third parties? And what about Bucks, you know, suburban women in Bucks County, Pennsylvania? I like it's too much, but I can deal with who I'm talking with right now today. Um, and it keeps me sane. It's it's really easy to be really anxious about this year if you look at the entire year as a whole. So to bring it back to your question, what this work has helped me do is it's introduced me to really smart people, really good people, uh, people who have a passionate, um, a passionate connection to uh, doing the work of uh, binding us together of like you and, and someone like Greg Lukianoff in his recent book and Todd Rose and, and um, uh, Monty Guzman all these great people of um, 
thoroughly diagnosing uh, the symptoms and the, the disease, the societal disease uh, that we live in, but even more importantly, um, helping us understand the prescriptions uh, for those diagnoses. So I don't know, that's probably a lot, but does that answer your question at all? Yeah, I think I just heard you say that meditation and your work on this podcast are keeping you sane. Yeah, it is. It is. In fact, it's one of the things that's helping me get to the upside of the happiness curve, <laughs> or maybe it's evidence <laughs> of going to the upside of the happiness curve. So before we go, I'm, I probably kept you a little bit longer uh, than, um, than, than you wanted to. But before you go, how can folks follow you, uh, find more information about your upcoming book? And I'll, I'll, put the, I'll definitely put the link to the Atlantic article in the show notes, but uh, how, how can folks follow all the great work that you're doing? Well, I have a website, jonathanrausch.com. I don't put all of my stuff up there because, you know, copyright law. But I put uh, many of my my bigger and best things on there. You can find my books, many of my articles, some of my speeches. I'm not very much a presence on social media anymore since Twitter became X, though I do tweet occasionally. But you won't really find me on social media. And um, when my next book is ready to come out, I'll be advertising it on every channel, including, I hope, your show. Absolutely. It's going to be called Cross Purposes, Christianity's Broken Bargain with Democracy. Oh, wow. It sounds yeah. ominous. Uh, is that the word? Uh I have to think about that. I definitely, absolutely. If you'll have me, I'll, you know, I would love to have you, man. That, that would be, uh, man. I would love to have that conversation with you. You are a convert to Christianity. You're in the thick of it. And I'd love to, uh, love to go through that with you. That'd be great. That'd be great. John, as always, man, this, this was just such a thrill. It's a, I just, I really love being with you, man. It's, um, it's good for the soul. <laughs> if you don't mind well, me saying you. so. It's, <laughs> it's mutual. Let's just hope your audience feels the same way. Either way, they'll, they'll like it <laughs> because I told them they're going to like it. <laughs> yeah, they better. The damn well better like I'm it. I'm a tyrant of a podcast. Listen, you host. people out there, like <laughs> this show. <laughs> That's right. The tyranny of the podcast host. Um, so as always, if you dig what we're doing here, remember to follow, rate, and write that review. And tell somebody about Talk Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You can recommend us really easily. Although I was going to say go to politicsandreligion.us, but John doesn't like our website, so I'm going to have to revisit that in the coming year. Uh, but no, that, go to the website. Just <laughs> redesign it. <Just> go there. <laughs> um, or you can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E and S is in Sam, at Corey S. Nathan. Now, go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week.